Thanks for the kind introduction, Cole. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, beautiful people here in this room today. I'm addressing all of you, by the way, with this. Hello, and thanks for being here. My name is Andre Vieira, and I have been doing optimization in one way or another for the past 10 years, folks. It's a long ass time. And I've helped more or less 100-ish brands optimize their journeys and get better results out of them. And now I have this thing called Looptimize, which is a customer journey optimization agency. However, none of this matters. What matters here right now is that for the next 20 to 25 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be doing my best to try and keep you folks entertained while getting a couple concepts across that I at least believe are really, really cool. And to kick things off, I would like to show you four images, after which I'm going to ask you a question, so pay attention. Image number one, we're looking at a bunch of cells. Image number two, some people playing chess. Image number three, street bike race of sorts. Image number four. Okay, I don't think I have a good explanation for this one. My best attempt here is, I think we're looking at a very lucky bastard wearing a suit, being grabbed by two women at the same time, but for some reason, he's definitely not enjoying the situation. I gave up explaining this, I don't know what's happening. Question for all of you, what is the common element that exists in all four images? Can anyone tell me? Competition, pretty good. To those of you who thought it was competition and got it right, can anyone tell me what is happening in image number one? Difficult, right? We're looking at a bunch of cells, it's pretty random, it's difficult. So, folks, this is a microscopic image of leukemia. This is blood cancer, which unfortunately is also one type of competition. But hey, competition. We as human beings, we have been competing ever since the dawn of time. We've been competing against each other, we've been competing against the environment, we've even been competing on a cellular level. But how come? Why do we even compete so much, right? Well, the answer is relatively simple. We compete because the resources we strive for, they're finite, they're not unlimited. If two of the lucky bastard in the suit existed, the women would not have to fight over the guy, right? And the same is true in online marketing. The resources we want, we have to earn those. There's not an unlimited amount of clicks. There's not an infinite amount of transactions, of conversions, of revenue. We have to compete for those things. And it turns out that these resources, the ones that we strive for, they are scattered around these things called customer journeys, which in my humble opinion are very well represented by the growth funnel. If you take your marketing initiatives and you try to create a sequence out of them, grouping them according to purpose, the most bare bones sequence of steps ever, you're gonna end up with something like this. Three groups, or in our case, three layers, acquisition, conversion, retention, right? Most of you, if not all of you, know that. The part they don't tell us is that this thing is a freaking battlefield. This is where you're gonna be playing your game. This is where you're gonna be competing for the resources that you want to get. But how can we become better at this game of competition? How can we do this thing better? How can we improve our odds of succeeding here? Enter the concept of competitive optimization. There's not much about this in the web. You're not gonna find a formal definition. So I took the liberty of writing one. But this thing is really academic, and every time that I read it out loud, this is the reaction that I get. People are like, what? It's complicated as hell. But it's not really. So I wrote, I wrote something different, simpler, for us to rock today, okay? So to me, competitive optimization is looking at customer journeys taking place on competitors' properties to use the shit out of the cool stuff you find there to your advantage, okay? By this point, some of you could be thinking, what is this competitive optimization thing? I've heard competitive analysis before. Is it the same? Are there differences? It's not the same, folks. There are some differences, and I'm going to highlight three of them for you now. The first difference is in the reason why you do competitive optimization versus competitive analysis. Competitive optimization is done targeting a very specific part of, your, of a customer journey that is taking place on your properties. So it's really targeted, it's really focused on solving one problem, one challenge, whilst 
Comparative analysis is usually done for generic benchmarking purposes, right? You want to know where you stand against your competition in, in general terms. The second thing here is the outcome. The goal from doing comparative optimization is to learn. So the things that you're going to get out of this, they become ideas, they become hypotheses, they're going to be prioritized against the rest of the hypotheses and ideas that you already have. In comparative analysis, on the other hand, the findings, they usually get reported with no clear next step because this is usually not planned beforehand. And finally, what we get here is a difference in ownership as well. Because for competitive optimization, it's usually going to be the experimentation team or the optimization team taking care of this. Meaning, it falls under the optimization umbrella and it's just one more method out of many methods that you have. For competitive analysis, it's usually the marketing team or the research and development team when your company has one of those, but it's not that common. And that also means that there are usually no bigger overarching principles. But yeah, with the differences out of the way, it's pretty important to say that competitive optimization is not by any stretch of imagination meant to be used as a standalone method. Think of this as an addition, one more weapon in your arsenal, another method that you have to promote optimization in your company, okay? Now, I want to take you folks back to this real quick. The answer to the first question that I presented to you today was competition. That was a common element, right? But most of us in this room, we didn't know what picture number one was about. There was a piece of the puzzle that was missing, correct? Turns out, folks, that optimization programs, experimentation programs, they're very much like this. We don't have the full information because we know what our customers are doing in our platforms, in our environment, but we have no idea of how they're interacting with the environments of our competitors. And this matters, and it matters a lot. To illustrate this a bit better, I brought an example from Google. Google conducted this study in 2017 with this 27-year-old girl named Caitlin, who, by the way, is probably 29 now. And Caitlin, she was shopping for three items. She wanted to buy three different things. She wanted to buy yoga pants, she wanted to buy a new doormat, and she wanted to buy some sort of personal care products. Now, I have to apologize in advance for the fact that the image of the girl in the yoga pants in there looks like she's I'm about to take a massive dump over there. That is actually the result, ladies and gentlemen, of my best efforts at Google Images, trying to search for a picture of yoga pants that is family friendly and can be displayed to all of your beautiful eyes today. Have any of you ever tried this effort? Go to Google Images, type yoga pants, press enter. Do not do it close to your spouses and wives and kids and everything. It's, it's just not a good idea. But I digress. To the matter at hand, what really matters here, Look at how many interactions this girl had. 359 brand retailer interactions, 87 mass online retailer interactions. She saw a lot of things while looking for these three products. She spoke to a lot of competitors. And this matters a lot because this is going to change her perception of your brand when she's navigating your website. It's gonna shape the expectations that she has with regards to the navigation on your website, on your platform. So this matters. Do not go home thinking, yeah, my competitors are doing this, I'm doing that, it doesn't matter what they're doing. It does matter because it changes what your uh, customers are going to expect from you, okay? It's, import it's important to keep that in mind. Now, we understand why it's important to do this thing. That's what the previous five to six minutes were about. Let's talk about how to get our hands dirty, shall we? For the method that I want to present to you guys today, we're gonna to be needing three things, not more than three. First, we need the what. We need to understand what competitors are worth our time. Who should we look at in terms of competition? Then, we're gonna need the what. Competitive insight. Stuff about the journeys happening on competitors' platforms. What is happening there that is cool? What should I take away from those? And finally, the how, ideas for optimization. How do we transform those findings? How can we exploit them in order to make money, right? Because that's what we're here for. And it all starts with the who. Not the amazing 60s band, unfortunately, but the who in this case are our competitors. And very, very often when we try to do this exercise, finding what competitors to analyze, we tend to look at our strongest competitors. And we have good reasons to do that, right? 
We believe those guys, they know what they're doing. So the idea here would be to look at the cool stuff happening in their journeys and copy it, use it in your journeys. Or if you're not comfortable with the concept of copying, using their insights for inspiration. I hope some of you can sleep better at night with this. But that is the gist. Why do we do that, folks? We do that because we believe these guys, our strongest competitors, we think they're smart, we think they're hard workers, we think they're masters of their craft. They give us a hell of a difficult time after all, don't they? Uh, let me show you a picture of our competitors enjoying some fresh water by the pool. These are the folks we're competing with. It's depressing, isn't it? And the thing here is, more often than not, our competitors are just as fucking lost as we are. It's important to keep that in mind. Don't take my word for it. We have the master himself, Mr. Optimization, more like Mr. Business Growth, am I right now? It changed. So this is what Pep said. Stop copying your competitors. They don't know what they're doing either. It's, the, the voice is too deep, I cannot replicate it. I tried. Pep's words, keep this thing in mind, it's important. Our competitors don't always know what to do. But hey, the math is getting complicated, right? What do we do here, what happens? First, we're supposed to look at the strongest competitors. But then, evidence suggests that these guys are shitheads as well. Even Pep is telling us to not look at them and to not copy from them. So hey, what gives? What are we supposed to do here? Well, it's not that they're all stupid all the time. They wouldn't be our strongest competitors if that was the case, right? But that isn't the case. Those guys, they get some things right every now and then. The problem, from my perspective, stems from the fact that every time we hop into this exercise, finding our strongest competitors, we tend to go, excuse me, we tend to go to the same three sources. And the first source we ask is ourselves, who are our strongest competitors? Then we get lost, we ask our colleagues, hey, who do you think are our strongest competitors? And then we, reali we realize no one knows the shit they're talking about. Then we go to market research and market data, right? These three sources, folks, they have something in common. They don't matter. And they're not gonna tell you what competition is relevant in your case. However, there's one source we can always ask questions to who's 99% of the times give us the right answers, the real truth. Have you ever heard of those beautiful, blessed, beautiful, beautiful creatures? The customers. We can ask the customers. I know what you're thinking right now. This must be the peak of innovation. This is the highlight of the conference. No more brilliant ideas coming after this. But really, it's surprising. It's obvious, but we forget about it all the time. So let your customers be the judge of who you should be looking at in terms of competition. Do not try to do this by yourself. All you gotta do in this case is ask, and this can be done in very, very simple ways. I have four suggestions to give you. By the way, I have no affiliation with any of these logos or any of the companies presented in those, in those slides. But one way you can use, you can do that, is through Hotjar. You can use an on-site poll to ask about what competition your visitors are also going to. And this can be done in a myriad of different ways. You can send out in your newsletter or in, a, in some type of survey via email the question as well. Hey, do you buy from different competitors? Do you buy from other companies? How often? If you're doing, thing number three over there, if you're doing user research and user testing, first of all, air high five, boom, kudos to you. If you're not, all of you should be doing it, by the way. Take that home with you. But if you're doing that, if you're doing user testing and user research, that is a good opportunity to ask those questions as well. And finally, if you're keeping up with the times and you have one of those fancy chatbot things in your platform, you can also use the chatbot to present this type of question. Here are some examples of clients of mine who have presented the question before. I'm not gonna go too deep into this or even cover the examples now because I put together a very cool landing page for you folks at looptimize.com slash elite camp 2019. And in there, you're gonna be able to find the slides. You're gonna be able to find some notes about the slides. I think two or three questions that you can present in your platform to try and identify what competitors are relevant for you. And finally, I'm also taking you, um, I'm also uh, bringing you two other methods that you can use for this. One is using the Facebook audience overlap tool. You can find relevant competitors in there as well. And the other one is using the Alexa tool. And we're not talking about our lovely Alexa who spoke yesterday. It's also not the Alexa you speak with when you're very lonely in those rainy evenings, you know. 
I'm sorry for you, by the way, I'm sad. Um, but yeah, this is a different Alexa, also owned by Amazon. But this one is the one that gathers website data, data about websites, and makes it available to you for a price. But their competitor analysis too is, uh, it offers a free trial, I think of seven days. This is another valid way to get to your competitors, to identify who's relevant and who isn't. This URL is going to appear at least one more time during the presentation, so if you couldn't take notes right now, don't worry too much about it. So three things are necessary, right? And the first one is out of the way. We know who we should look at in terms of competition. Now, what should we be taking away from this competition? What parts of these journeys are really interesting? How do we find this out? We're going to be doing, to figure this out, a little bit of user testing. But it's more than just user testing. We're going to be doing competitive user testing, because this is what the talk is about. And for that, folks, we can use two different methods. We can go for direct comparison testing, or we can go for isolated comparison testing. Both methods are really good, and both methods are a lot like each other, with one tiny difference. We're going to talk about this just now. First, direct comparison testing. What do we want to do here? Step number one, you're going to recruit visitors, you're going to recruit customers, and you're going to give them a task for them to complete. Thing is, the task has to be a slice of a journey. It cannot be the full journey. What do I mean with a slice of a journey? Subscribing to a newsletter, creating an account, adding a product to the cart, perhaps, something small contained. The full journey would be click on this ad, enter the website, create an account, fill up your billing information, fill up your shipping information, now add a product to the cart, remove the product. People get tired, really tired. And this introduces a lot of bias in the results that you get from doing this exercise. So try to keep this to slices of journeys. But hey, recapping, we recruited customers, right, to conduct user testing with, and we gave them a task. Next thing, we're going to be presenting them websites where they can complete the task that you gave them. Finally, after they're done completing the task on those websites you presented, one of, one of these websites has to be yours, by the way, OK? It's your website versus the websites from competitors. This is what makes the, the method interesting. After you're done with this part, you're going to be asking them questions about what you saw, about what they did. Because sometimes people do things that really don't seem to make sense during these sessions. So you can ask them questions afterwards. This is direct comparison testing. The second method, isolated comparison testing, it's very much the same, with one tiny difference. We are going to be recruiting customers. We are going to be giving them a slice of a journey to complete. But the difference is on the second step. We're not going to be presenting multiple websites at once. We're only going to ask them to do the task in one website. And then you can also ask them questions afterwards if you have those. The upside of doing this thing this way is that when you only present one website, as I said before, your interviewees, they don't get as tired. And it also allows you to go much deeper into the, into the exploration that you're conducting on the challenge. You can also interview many more people in the same time that you would interview just one using the other method. Um, so this is the plus side. You, you manage to go deeper. The cons of doing this thing this way, as opposed to direct comparison testing, um, is that you lose the ability to ask the customer which one did you prefer? And then it's really fresh in their minds. They just went through the experiences, right? So you usually get good answers when you ask that. Now, in my personal experience, the previous method, direct comparison testing, is better suited for when you're just getting started. You're just starting to get a grasp of what is the challenge that you're solving, how you're supposed to solve it, and where the problems really are. When you have this notion already, then I suggest you switch to isolated comparison testing. Both very powerful methods. If you're going to conduct this thing, th these things, uh, I have four quick tips to offer you. First, use the think aloud method. You, uh, ask your interviewees, basically, to manifest verbally their thoughts. What are they thinking about? Ask them to pronounce that out loud. Uh, it's going to help you understand some of the confusion that sometimes happens in the screen. Second thing is that you should record the whole thing. People say and do a lot of stuff during these sessions. It's easy to forget. It's hard to remember exactly what happened at all times. So try to keep a recording out of this. Next thing is, if you're doing direct comparison testing and showing multiple websites, do not show more than three. This is the sweet spot that I found. Feel free to play around with this. But in my experience, if you show more than three websites at a time, you introduce a lot of cognitive load at once. 
that gets people tired pretty fast. Answers are not as good at the end. And finally, shut up. Really, please do. During user testing, you're not supposed to be talking. Unless there's something that really, really requires you to talk, do not talk. And don't take it from me. From me. We just heard from the queen of user research herself. This is a quote from Els. 99% of the talking during a user test should be done by the user. So folks, shut up. And I'm not the one telling you this. You're going to get better results if you shut up. Good news. This is complex. This is complicated. But we don't have to do it every day. In my experience, if you do this type of process just once or twice a year, either targeting your most burning challenges or trying to cover the whole funnel, you will get very, very good insights already. You don't have to commit to doing like sprints, I don't know, every now and then with this. Once or twice should be enough. Now, we know who we should be looking at in terms of competition. We know what to take away from these guys. Our customers are telling us that, right? How do we transform this into money? How do we convert these, these findings into tests? Correct? This is what we're here for. So after you're done with the whole process, you're going to have a lot of recordings, a lot of material, a lot of data. It's hard to go through the whole thing unless you have a method for that. I have a very, very simple one to suggest. This is how I, I myself always start by doing this. It's a very, very easy way to start. I look for two things in my analysis. First, highlights. Second, glaring differences. So first, highlights. What parts of the customer journeys of your competitors did your customers tell you were awesome? Or, it hurts to hear, but were better than yours. Those are highlights. You should be paying close attention to the reasons why your customers think those parts of the journeys are better than yours. And second, glaring differences. So you take the same point in the funnel and you see that there's a glaring difference between the way you do it and your competitors do it, you're also onto something here. It's also worth exploring. Every time you found a highlight, every time you found a glaring difference, you found yourself a testing idea. You have a hypothesis in your hand. Okay? And then, of course, you can go much, much deeper than this. You can go full out on quantitative and qualitative analysis of all kinds of crazy variables you want. Be my guest. Warning, forewarning, this is really difficult to do. It takes a lot of time because it's a manual process. However, I do understand that some of you will get curious and we want to try your hand at this. So again, landing page. You're going to find a template there to help you with this thing. It's a template uh, from, a, from an article that I wrote for PEP for Conversion Excel, I think one year ago, give or take. And with this template, you're going to be able to compare the journeys of your competitors with yours. And you're also going to be able to post, like, to, to have screenshots of these pages side by side, which is already unbelievably helpful. It's really, really good to see the pages side by side. You already get some findings from doing this. But if you want to go deeper, the template also allows you to store metrics and observations. I let instructions with some suggestions of metrics that you could try to store in there. But be my guest. Play around with this thing. Make it your own, by all means. All right? So that was a lot of work. We just did a ton of things here. I think it's time for us to reap the rewards, right? We know who we should be looking at. We know what to take away from these guys, from our competitors. And now we also have the ideas. So all we got to do now is get those ideas and roll them out on our websites, correct? No, of course not. We should know better by this point. Optimization is a bitch. It's never, ever this simple. Please A-B test all of your findings. And allow me to remind you why. These folks are our competitors. This is the level of intellect we're dealing with. Keep it in mind at all times. We're using the best filter that exists for our findings. This filter are our customers, yes? Even with the filter, some bullshit is bound to go through. It always does. So please, test everything. It wouldn't be fair if I only quoted one side of what Mr. Laya over there said. So here's another quote from the master himself. I'm not saying your competitors are not getting some things right. You just don't know which factors are correct. The thing you copy is a hypothesis, and you need to test it. You need to test it. You really do. Please do not steal stuff from your competitors and go live with it. It's going to bite you in the ass later. So folks, 
What have we learned here today? We humans, we have been competing for a long ass time, right? Before, we competed for survival. We needed food, we needed resources, we needed to get by somehow. As time went by, as history wrote more of its lines, competition became more and more of a choice. How come though, that over the same history, so many brilliant minds, so many geniuses of our time actively chose to compete. Why did they do that? They had a choice. They chose to look at their peers. They chose to learn what to do and what not to do in order to excel. The reason is relatively simple, ladies and gentlemen. They didn't do it for themselves. They had the better, they had someone else in their minds. I ask you a question to close this thing up. If we do competitive optimization super well, if we do everything we just saw in this presentation properly, who's the real winner? It's not me, it's not you, it's not your company, believe it or not. It's also not the company across the street. The real winner from this whole thing are your customers. Keep that in mind at all times because your customer is the center of this whole thing. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much and see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.